Let's pray for Dean. Father, we thank you for Dean. Pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit on him now as he brings your word to us. May our hearts and minds be open to hear from you through Dean this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Move us over here a bit. It's funny where script um, talks come from. And um, I have got some notes at the back of the church. There's all sorts of things I'm going to cover at the end of um, the session, as I say, lesson. Um, actually, it came from a song, and there's this rap artist called Flame. And um, there's a little bit of preaching in that. And I thought, oh, there's a really interesting piece of script. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes, I know. Godly um, preach, um, rap artist. It's very good. That's what I'm listening to at the moment. <laughs> I am not going to rap. <laughs> okay, can we put the slides up, please? Thanks. It's going to be like... I'm, yeah, I'm going to try and use PowerPoints for now. I want to be a little more freer and um, yeah, a bit more me in the classroom. Okay, so we're looking at what do you need for life and godliness? That's the... the um, the area of this t- uh, talk this morning. So I'm going to go through. There's my little objectives. Uh, context. There we are. It's vanished. Context. <laughs> what do we need for a life and godliness? And why can we be confident that what Peter writes is the truth? And actually, I think we always need to come back to that. Why can we trust this? Yeah, why is it real? Why can we have faith in this? And I think that we need to always sort of come back to that. Otherwise, it's it's just like any, other, any old book that you might read. And so we've got to think about these people and what they have to say. And why, do, why are they credible? I think it's really quite important. To always think about those things. So, the context. This is Simon Peter, the chap who stumbled a lot, did some great things, and then repeatedly fell over. Okay, so he's got a lot to talk about, a um, lot to share, a lot of wisdom. And um, Peter wrote the two letters, one and two Peter, at the end of um, his life. In fact, he was imminently about to be put to death. And, um, yeah, so it was written between AD 65, 68, prior, prior to his martyrdom. And he wrote two letters. One Peter is about encouraging people to feed my sheep. I'm not preaching on that. And um, so, feed my sheep. Actually, we are his, his sheep, and we do need feeding. And we need feeding all the time. And we belong to him, and the Lord takes us to green pastures. The second um, letter to Peter is basically about stimulating Christian growth. It's about combating false teaching. It's about watchfulness in view of Christ's certain return. I'm going to focus on um, Christian growth. Because I think actually, I think that's something that we need to sort of cultivate and develop um, as Christ Church. But I think all, all of God's church, his whole body, needs to do this. So, first question life and godliness. How's that coming along? You know, what's that like for you? Godliness. Do you feel godly? Do you feel like that's sorted? Do you think, yeah, I've got that cracked? I'm doing a great job here? And no. <laughs> I never, if I've been truthful, there are times I thought, yeah, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm doing quite well. And then immediately afterwards, I fall down. And then I sort of allow sin to come in, or my pride comes in, and a little bit my conceit. And so I often feel like my, my own walk with Jesus is full of ups and downs. Sometimes my chest is, my shoulders are pulled back, and sometimes I feel like my face is in the ground. Okay, and I have to pick myself up again. And the Lord stretches out his hand. So this is the kind of the message he's trying to say to, to the early church, the people who he is writing to. Life and godliness. How's that coming along? Well, according to Peter, we have everything that we need. Because sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Actually, I don't feel like I'm doing a very good job. I don't feel particularly godly. I don't feel particularly holy. But Peter's saying we have everything we need. In fact, he says that in verse 2. His divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So the creator of the whole universe, the, the, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, has given us this power to help us live 
lead and live godly lives. How do you feel about that? That the God of the universe is not just letting us stumble. And we do feel like stumbling in life. I certainly feel like stumbling in life most of the time. But actually God has given us his power. We have access to that power. That's what he's saying. His, the Lord's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. There it is. So how? How has he done that? How do we access this divine power? Because I don't feel like it always, and I'm sure people in this room don't feel like it always either, even perhaps at this precise moment. Do I have access to this power to help me live a godly life? How is that possible? And it's through verse 3, very, makes it very clear, through our knowledge of him. And it all comes down to this, our knowledge of him, our heavenly father, our Lord Jesus. That's, I could almost stop there now. Okay, that's what it's about. If we want to live godly lives, we can have access to that power through our knowledge of him. Sounds almost too easy, doesn't it? Our knowledge of Jesus can give us this power to live godly lives. This is kind of me most of the time. Sometimes I feel I could live a godly life if dot, dot, dot. And those dot, dot, dots are if there were different circumstances in my life. If only I had a new family. <laughs> if only I had more different people in my life. You know, they make it so hard for me to be godly. So sometimes we feel like that. I'm, I'm, my family aren't too bad. I have other people in my life that perhaps give me issues. Um, my family, I've been, God has blessed me with my parents. And they might even hear this at some point. And um, yeah, we don't always get on all the time. My mum is actually very, very... I think my mum is probably the most godly person I've probably ever met. She has a characteristic that she tends to look down on, and it's called mercy. That is a characteristic of God. That is his default setting, as it were. Love and mercy. We don't always like that. She always feels, oh, you know... She always feels like it's it's like being weak, being mercy. Actually, it isn't. It takes a lot of strength. I think that's a real gift of my mom. I don't seem to have that gift. Okay? I have to work at that. I need the Lord's help. I need to know him more to, to have that. Perhaps I need an, a set of new work colleagues. Who's been there? <laughs> Do you know? Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I think I'm quite blessed at the moment. Those people have left. <laughs> Those are ones. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So up until this point, okay, uh, no, it's just, I, I will repent of this later on, okay? Um, <laughs> but it does feel like that, doesn't it? Sometimes there are your work colleagues feel, well, they make life difficult for you, and they, they're able to press buttons that kind of bring out the real you, or those things inside you that I really don't want, that I'm not happy with. So characteristics um, in my being. And, yeah, sometimes people around us make things difficult. And so it's so easy, and I have been there, if only those people weren't in the office, okay? <laughs> then I would be great. I could be really holy then. I could be godly. I could be merciful if there was no one else around me, um, okay? Uh, <laughs> So, sometimes, therefore, it's almost coming back to this, I need a new personality. If only I was knitted together. See, it's God's fault, says, because he knitted me together. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate, isn't it? We sometimes actually blame God. Because when you created me, you knitted me together. And I think one of our big sins is often, I know we're kind of laughing at this, but actually, almost comes back to we're blaming him. I think that is a real... You, perhaps have a think about this over the weeks ahead, and... Some, I think there are things, and I'm like this, we, we can fool ourselves that this is not the case, but I think sometimes we're almost thinking, actually, it is your fault, really, and, and that's not true. And that's maybe something that we need to repent of, and I do have to repent of that quite a lot of the time. For some people, it'll be a new past. We've had things um, in our lives that um, have left scars, 
and their wounds. And we think, if it wasn't for that, I could leave a godly life. But I think God can overcome all. I think our knowledge of God with him and his power, I think it's not about them. I don't think we need any of those things. What we need is to know God. And even something here sounds almost too good to be true. And it isn't instantaneous. And that's one of the things we need to kind of come back to. We all know that. Every single one of us in this room know that, unfortunately, we are not transformed overnight. And that can be extremely frustrating. It is frustrating for me. So we need to, to process, so we need to get to know God. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. That's the key message. And then he goes on to say, may grace and peace be yours and mine in abundance. May we be overwhelmed with his grace and his peace through the knowledge of of our Lord Jesus. May we be, oh, wouldn't that be great to be, we can have access to that. May the grace, this is what Paul's prayer is really. May the grace and peace be ours in abundance. And he can say that because he's received that abundant grace and peace. Paul and Peter had that abundance. He was an He was not perfect at all. We know, if you know Peter, we all know Peter in the Bible. He is a man of highs and lows. And that's why he can say that. Because he's had it himself. He's a credible person. Who needs more peace and grace in their life here at Christ Church? Who needs that more peace? We've all got different circumstances and things in our lives. Who wants more peace and grace? We all do. So why don't people live godly lives? You open your eyes. You can see what um, Nigel talked about um, this morning, uh, um, Syria. You can look at the news. You can step outside this church and outside your homes. We can see that there are lots of people who don't live godly lives. And it's because they don't know God. I mean, the giveaway is in the title, isn't it? Godly. If we want to live godly lives, then we have to know God. There is no other way. And if you don't know him, you cannot be godly. A lot of people think that they can they think they can live good lives without God. And the truth is, and we've, we went through a season of Romans, and I think it was a very difficult season, but it was an amazing book. And it's really hard. Because we sometimes fool ourselves to think that we're actually good. In, that, in the book of Romans, Pete, um, Paul is saying that actually no one is good. And now Jesus said that. And sometimes we're conning ourselves that we are. Why do people live godly lives? It's because they don't know God. Life without a knowledge of God is grim. It is grim. Look at that horrible list. This is Romans 1. We can see this. People are wicked. There is lots of sexual immorality. We are greedy and selfish. There is a lot of strife and deceit, gossiping and slandering. And I think it's a really interesting one, that last one. And we disobey our parents. I think that's a really interesting one, that one, isn't it? It's in that list in Romans 1. Who thinks disobeying our parents should be on there? (laughs) Well, if you've got kids, you probably think it should be there. But is it, you know, I'm not going to put a rank in this, but we'd almost kind of could do with a ranking there. Yes, I think it should be the bottom. It's just really interesting. I mean, it's in one of the commandments, isn't it? 
disobeying your parents. And often we have strife at home because we have that messy relationships with our parents sometimes. And we allow sin, perhaps our greed and our selfishness and, and our own way. None of us, no one wants strife at home. I don't think anyone wants that. So why do these things happen? So why, are, why do that list, why do those things happen? Because we don't honour God. We reject the knowledge of God. And this one's really, I think, really quite powerful, really. We suppress the truth of God by our wickedness. I know I've got people around me, and they do, and I've had these conversations. I don't necessarily see myself as evangelist, but I'm trying to kind of sort of share my faith more. And um, it's at home with some of my friends. And there are often times I have to kind of gauge how much I can say. So I don't want to completely bombard them. So I need to know when to shut up. So when you share your faith, you need to know how much you're going to give and know when enough is enough. And in some conversations, people, and there have been times when they, it has been suppressed and they've almost like turned away, right, that's enough now. You don't want to talk about it anymore. And often I've had conversations where that has definitely happened. And I silently weep inside. People do suppress the knowledge of God. Because if people confessed that there is God, that he is God, then life can't, can't be the same again, can it? And so I just wonder whether some people don't. I have got examples in my life, which if they, I, some people might listen to this, I'm going to be very careful. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's like we, we do, almost, we close our eyes and we stop our ears. Because if we believed that God is real, Jesus is real and he died and he rose again and is the son of God, and that there's a judgment waiting, you can't, you'd be very, very foolish to continue the way you're, you're living. Something needs to change. And sometimes I think people don't want to change. And that's why I think they suppress it. So they can carry on what they're doing. And I think we all do that to some... I'm not, I don't think that's... Let's say people who are not Christians. I think we as Christians can do a little bit of that as well. I think that was quite sad, really. God is not an idea. I'm not sure most people, listen to that evangelism talk and statistics, most people actually believe, the vast majority, I can't remember it, is 60%, believe that Jesus existed, and a big percentage even believe he was the son of God, and then he died and rose again. It's, there's some really amazing statistics, which we'll probably talk about in the future. Um, so for a lot of people, this is not an issue. For some people, they have an intellectual faith, so like Christianity is like an, a theory or an idea. But it's not an idea. He is a person. He is Jesus. And if we destroy or cover up God as a person, then you're going to you're going to live ungodly lives. Because then I think you pick and mix. Then, if it's an idea, well, I like that idea, but I don't like that, so I'm not going to do anything with it. But if it's a person, that's a whole different ball game. You now, Christianity isn't a religion; it's a person; it's a relationship. It was interesting, one of the, uh, I mean, we are dipping into this evangelism talk, and one of the guest speakers said, um, saying something kind of like, um, like most of you are married in this room. Could you imagine saying, you come home from um, work, and you say, well, actually, I'm not going to speak to you today, I'm too tired. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm not going to spend any time with you. I'm not going to talk to you at all. I do that to God lots of times. 
oh, I can't be bothered to. That's terrible, isn't it? I can't be bothered to spend time. I'm just too tired. Do I have to? But if we did that with the people around us and our family, then actually that's, that's kind of unacceptable. So when I was living with my mum and dad, and um, obviously a while ago, I'd come home from work, be tired, and I have to have my little routine, because I'm not very good at speaking with people when I come through the front door normally. But I knew that I'd have to say, greet my parents, and my mum would be at home. So I need to say, oh, hello, I'm home. I'm just gonna have, I need to get ready, I just need to have a wash and change, and I'd come home, and be normal then, downstairs. But there's got to be, if we're human beings, and there's people who matter to us, you know, we know that we have to respect them. We need to acknowledge them. We need to spend some time with them. We need to talk to them. So calm. There may be times of the day where we're more chatty than others. I, can, you know, I think the Lord knows that. But I think it's very easy for us. Oh, I can't be doing that. I'm just I'm too tired now. But I, I think we can invite God into that space. Even if you don't read your Bible at that point, I think you can say you can slump down on the sofa and get a cup of tea and say, oh, Lord, I feel really tired now. And just say, oh, and then just, and you might say, well, why are you feeling tired? Well, it's been a really horrible day and students have been, uh, they've been listening. They haven't done any work or whatever it is. I mean, that's what prayer and relationship's about. And you probably don't need to spend too long doing that. But you've invited in, you've kind of said something. What are we going to say? Yes. Yep. So we need to allow space. And actually, if you're tired, you don't want to say much anyway, but you only need to just invite God into that space, tell him how you feel, pause because you're tired, while well, you're listening then. And God is not going to shout at us. You know, it's that Elijah passage. He's not going to shout at us. That's what he whispers. He's He's quiet. We just need to kind of tune our ears into that. So knowing God changes you. That's what it's about. If you want to live godly lives, knowing him changes you. I really wish this was quick. <laughs> um, but that would overwhelm me. And so God doesn't do that. Sometimes we feel it'd be easy if I was just completely miraculously transformed. But then none of us would be Christians because we'd be too frightened and it would just overwhelm us. So why it might be frustrating when you realize your sins and your character flaws, actually the Lord knows what he's doing. He knows how to deal with them and he knows when and he does that in a very perfect way. He knows us exactly how we are, when. He's not going to overwhelm us. So compare in your mind now, compare your life now before you knew Jesus. Or compare your life, you've been, most people only have been Christians a long time. But even over the last, you know, are you different now than you were 12 months ago or five years ago? Compare your own life before and after Jesus. What, what's foolish to you now? Is the cross foolish to you? To me, it was tithing. Why on earth people would tithe? And I can remember here, I think they must be mad. Why would you, t- I mean, for lots of, I don't think I had an issue with the cross or a diving saviour, probably because they didn't fully understand it. So when I became a Christian, it was kind of, I think it's only later on that I've really started to understand what actually that meant and the significance. It's funny how, how we learn but for me, it would have been tithing. Why would people do that? But I think getting to know him, I know it, it's, it's completely different than what I thought. Often people think of tithing as a church membership. You know, I, I belong to National um, English Heritage, so I have to pay a, um, uh, a membership fee for that. This is what most, a lot of people think this about church tithing. They think it's like a membership fee. Okay. So if I don't pay my membership for English Heritage, they're not going to let me in. Okay? And I just wonder if people think about that as church. Or you might do, which I do occasionally when I go to St. Albans. I sneak around the back and get in for free. And um, 
I've got two entrances. You can't do that in St. Paul's because they're really sorted, but um, in, in London. But sometimes you go, oh, we're going to sneak in for free. Yes. Or it's, I pay this because I'm a member of Christ Church. Tithing is not really about that. It's not about that at all. It's giving back a bit of what God has already given you, the, out of the abundance or whatever he's given you. And actually, it's saying, I want the Lord to do amazing things here in this church and this town. And so the bowers and all sorts. We want God, to, we want his kingdom to come. I think tithing is very much about showing a, a gratitude what he has given us. And actually saying, yes, Lord, we want your kingdom to come. And God wants us to give because he is a giving God. And giving generously is really important. It's about character. It's not a financial kind of um, sermon. But what I'm trying to make the point is that knowing God changes you, changes your mind, it changes the things that are important to you. I used to think this and now I think this. The Lord has changed me. You've still got a lot of things to change. So what do we mean by knowing God? It's not a pub quiz. That's the first thing. So this is what I'm trying to say is about facts. So what's the third book of the Bible? You don't need to answer this, right? Okay. What were the, sa- what were the sayings that Jesus said? What, 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 what things did he say on the cross? Who's his favorite woman in the Bible? His mom, of course. He's a bachelor. So, <laughs> so it's a pub quiz. It's not a pub quiz, knowing God. Okay. What do we mean by a knowledge of God? It's really important that we do know God and we um, we read our Bible. That's a really good way of knowing him. And it's just a shame that so many Christians just don't read the Bible and don't really know God. Okay, I think it's, um, I'm taking the mickey now, but a lot of, too many Christians don't know God enough because they're not reading their Bible. That is a real amazing source. It's a gift, actually. It's a gift from God. And you could read from Matthew all the way to Revelation. You will, and you might do it in little bits, you'll get to know Jesus doing that. Because how else are you gonna how else are you gonna find? But it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not about facts. If I go to pub quizzes, they often say, What's the third book of the Bible? Okay. If you really had known me, Jesus says, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. This is um, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Now, they were lucky. Jesus was there right next to them so that they lived with him for three years. But we have it in his, he, he has shared, they have witnessed, they are eyewitnesses, those disciples. And they're sharing what they learned, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Oops. Right, one of the things that I was given, I think it was a Christmas present last year. It's just called Imagining the Ignatian Examine. There are copies, of, there's two little bits I've given out there outside, which I'd like you to take home. And I think they'll be emailed or as well. And this is just adapted... Um, Saint Ignatian's Examine. Okay, so it's, but this is a really nice way of doing it. It is simple. In this book, there are about 35 different little exercises. So there's one for every day with some extra. I've not done that. I've just given you two. And basically, it, it's, it's for busy people. It's activity. It was designed for busy people. And that you spend no longer than 15 minutes doing this. In fact, he's recommended that you get your watch or your um, phone and you time 15 minutes. Because he doesn't want you looking at your watch. So you're just confident that the buzzer's going to go and you can stop. And what you do is you sit down and you are inviting the Lord to come and walk with you through your day. Whatever the, whatever the exercise says, but it's generally a walk. And you're inviting the Lord to come and walk with you for 15 minutes. 
and and that's in, and you will get to know him through that exercise. You're sharing, and you invite him in, and he will help you to think about the things that have happened that day. And they're not always the things that you imagine they will be, which I always found quite surprising. And he will, and then there's an opportunity to talk to him and for you to say sorry, or for you to say thank you for what's taken place. And so, remember, Jesus is a person. You're inviting the person Jesus to be with you and to walk with you in your mind's eye to sit there and to walk and just just go through my day. Let's just think about what's happened this day. And then you just have a nice, you have a kind of conversation and you speak, but you also kind of pause and listen. You know, where's the Lord? How's the Lord speaking to you in your heart? They're outside. They're, I've only just given you two days. Um, I'd like you to do an experiment. And then if it's rubbish and it doesn't work, throw it away. Okay, so there's no one... One size fits all. So this may work for some people, and it's not going to work for others. If it doesn't work for you, fine, great. But at least you tried it, and there may be something else. So can you do, there's two days, so don't do them both on the same day. That's really important, okay? <laughs> so just do one a day, and I'll give you two days. 15 minutes, phone, 15. You set it, it goes off in 15 minutes and you're, and you're finished. And it's like a little prayer beforehand and little, maybe the Lord's Prayer afterwards. And you're just inviting him and see what happens. Experiment. And if you think it's great, get yourself a copy of it. It's about nine quid on Amazon. Okay. Um, it'll be in your notes. I'll put a little reference to it. I've just found it really helpful. Some days are difficult because I've been naughty. Well, I'm a naughty every day, but some days I feel especially naughty or I've noticed I've been naughty. It's more like it. And I feel, oh, I don't really want to talk about that God. And, um... But I've found that God doesn't hit me over the head. I think he's always extremely merciful. And um, I think it's Psalm 102. Let's just have a quick look. Oh, I'm not sure I can find it now. It's a bit where he, um, the psalm, it talks about that he doesn't, one, he's mindful that we're dust. And two, that he doesn't, um, ah. I'm sure it's, I could have swore it was 102. Clearly it isn't. He shows us, basically it says that he shows us more mercy than we actually deserve. I can't remember, I have to look it up when I go home. And um, yeah. And I think he's very gentle with us. Sometimes we think that God's going to be really harsh with us, actually. I think he's not like that, actually, at all. I think he's, he's gentle with us, and he does, and he's sometimes just a little quiet voice. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I won't have to come back to you on that one. Is it 103? I knew it was somewhere around that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, what verse is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so verse 10 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. 
for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Now that kind of sounds really harsh. I don't think that's a horrible statement. He just knows that actually we are not God. We're not perfect and we're not holy. Right. Okay, we're nearly finished. So what else does Peter go on to say? He says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness. You said mutual, I think yours was better actually, mutual kindness, I think it was, and love. For if you possess these quantities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Now, half of me is saying about strive. I'm not sure we should. It's, he says make every effort, but sometimes I think we can overstrive, and then we kind of beat ourselves up. So there's a bal- I think there's a balance here. Yes, I think we do need to make every effort, and it's not a ticking. I've done that. I'm, oh, I'm good. I'm. What do you say? I've got good knowledge. I've got good self-control. Yes, I've got perseverance. I, I don't. I think life's far too messy for that. But I think he wants us to. I mean, I think he wants us to be disciplined. Yes, make every effort to do that. But we are going to fall short. And then we come to the Lord and we say sorry, or we say sorry to each other, which is probably what we need to do as well. So we repent to the Lord and with each other. Because often those are about people, aren't they? Who wants to be ineffective and unproductive? I don't think anyone in this room. If we think about our walk, our witness, the use of our gifts... None of us want to be ineffective or unproductive for the Lord. Spending time with him, he is the one who's going to equip us. He's going to give us the power. He'll tell us when and what to do. If you're going to be an evangelist, he doesn't necessarily want you to speak to everyone. We've got to listen to him. Because he's already been working in those people. He's been working in their hearts. The harvest is ripe. And the Lord says, right, that's the person. We, we can share, we can sow seeds, and I think we ought to do that. But sometimes we also need to know, actually, the Lord is saying, let's do that. If we want to be productive, we need to walk with, we need to walk with our Lord, we need to walk with Jesus and, and grow in sensitivity to him. And say yes to him and be obedient. Right, I'm nearly finished. How can we be confident in what people said? Is the truth. Because he says, I was there. I was there. Oops. I was an eyewitness. I'm just going to read verse 16 to 18 out. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory, for he received honor and glory from God our Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Verse 18, we ourselves, that's Peter and John, and I can't remember the other person's name, Peter, John, and um, James. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Right, what was that event called? The transfiguration. And that's when Peter said, well, I'll create those booths for you. Okay, he would say, I was there. I saw him. I saw him transformed. And the other thing we can be confident about the gospel is, we can just look at Peter. He died shortly after that. How many people would die for a lie? And I think this is, this is really important. Some people say, oh, you know, can we really believe in this? Is it true? Lots of people have laid down their lives for this. I mean, would you prepare to lay down your life if it was a lie? 
would he prepare to die on that cross? It's just not logical, is it? People just don't die for lies. He saw it. He's claiming he saw Jesus. In fact, these disciples saw Jesus resurrected. They saw him dead, and then they saw him alive. And sometimes I think we forget about that, the power behind this. This is not just a story. There is absolute truth in this. And they're saying, this is our testimony. We can have confidence in this. So, let's keep asking and seeking and knocking. Let's keep coming to the Lord. Let's keep seeking. Don't give up. We really do not know what we're missing. Even if we are spending time with the Lord, there's always more. The Lord is generous. He wants to give us an abundance. Yes, there'll be hard times. He's going to be with us. The Lord is near. He is a heartbeat and a breath away. He's not up in the sky as such. He's here. He's with you, walking. Are we listening? Are we noticing? And I really want, I commend this psalm to you. I've said it quite a lot. I'm, psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I ask for, one thing I ask from the Lord this only do I seek. What comes next? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I'm not. Con- this is something I've just started to practice, perhaps over the last, I know, six months. And it takes a while, but it really is worth pursuing to gaze upon the beauty and you gaze upon the beauty by finding him in your scriptures and walking with him and spending time you'll fall in love I know it sounds totally bizarre this how can you fall in love with Jesus if if I can't see him and touch him how is that possible but you can and you fall in love with him by gazing upon his beauty, by spending, slowly reading his word, spending time with him in in prayer, and listening. Let's practice that. I think I'm going to leave it at that point. Right, I'm not sure where we're going to go now, okay? (laughs) I'm not very, I told you, someone was talking, I'm not very good at landing my lessons. That's what we were talking on the way home (laughs) yesterday, didn't I? And there you are, look. Okay. (laughs) Let's just pause for a few moments, okay? And let's just invite the Lord. Yeah. The Lord's nice, actually, he's messy as well. The Holy Spirit is messy. So let's just, perhaps open our, let's just open our hands out. Let's just be quiet for a few minutes. And if you want to say anything to the Lord in your hearts, say it to him. If you want something, Ask him. So we pray, come Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit, fill this place. Meet us in our point of need.